Tom, thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I know it was really difficult to convince you to take the afternoon out to drink some beer with us. Uh, thanks for throwing yourself in there. <laughs> <laughs> no problem at all. Pleasure. Uh, wh where, where are you joining us from? Are you up in the northeast? Yes, I'm in my kitchen in Newcastle. Amazing. Yeah, it's uh, it's been proper wintry up there. My folks are um, just in between Newcastle and Hexham, uh, so they send me regular um, photographs out the window. They've been oh, yeah. sheltering all this time and uh, keeping me up to date with the weather. Um, so it looks like it's going to turn. We're going to get into spring, but let's start off uh, this afternoon um, getting into one of these beers. We've got two, two actually quite strong beers in front of us. Let's start with the the, the lower ABV one, we've got an NZ uh, Hopfenweiss. Is that a style? Are you, are you familiar with Hopfenweiss, Tom? Shall we talk you through it? Um, not terribly. I've had a few uh, Weiss beers, German <laughs> Weiss beers in my time. Hopfenweiss, you, yeah, you probably... Uh, so I, I think the Hopfen means delicious. Is that right, Paul? <laughs> Because yeah. I'm not a massive fan of ice beers, but I really like these, Tom. So, yeah. So uh, years ago, a company uh, called Brooklyn Brewery uh, that's uh, really headed up by a wonderful, uh, wonderful, wonderful man called Garrett Oliver uh, made a collaboration with a classic German brewery called Schneider and Son, and they they made a, a Hopfenweiss, which is a hoppy wheat beer. Now it was a it was somewhat sort of um, timid, I guess, compared to. Uh, what we tend to make ourselves. We tend to use really, really bold, bright, new world hops. This has got hops in all the way from New Zealand. The hop from Weiss that uh, Schneider and uh, Brooklyn made w w always tended to sort of feature uh, either some combination of European hops, but occasionally also dipping into the NZ territory. So we, we like to kind of amp things up. Uh, so this is quite a bold beer. You're definitely going to get those classic vice beer um, esters from the yeast. So you might get banana, you might get like bubblegum, you might get clove, and then pretty much everything else that's fruity uh, is going to come from the hops. So let's see what you think of it. Victoria, how does this go down for you? Uh, well, I've already poured mine straight away. So cheers. <laughs> cheers. Oh, look at Tom's classy glass. Mm. Yeah. I like that. Got my nice. Glassware out for this. What What would be your favorite style of beer, Tom? What's the one that you automatically sort of go back to time and time again? Um, well, I'm generally quite enthusiastic about beer. So, <laughs> Excellent. Um, there aren't many I wouldn't, you know, uh, but if I'm being sentimental, it would probably be a sort of bitter, you know, mm. like an English bitter, something like Jennings, something like that. Yeah. Um, but nowadays, I'm probably going to drink a more likely something, you know, a bit fruitier or hoppier, um, like a, an IPA. Or a, but I think my tolerance, my enthusiasm for and tolerance for beer <laughs> are going in slightly different directions. <laughs> They're directly exactly. inverse. <laughs> um, so, yeah, more like a session IPA now. Um, but obviously, these days, we're not going out having sessions so often so yeah and do you remember what the beer was that first got you sort of into craft rather than lager was it those those sort of traditional english ales on cask yeah i don't difficult to remember when that happened for me because um it, yeah it has sort of gradually taken over a lot especially in cities uh i mean i'm used to yeah, like old fashioned pubs having craft ale, what used to be called craft ales, but now it's kind of a different, different bunch of beers, isn't it? Um, I don't know. I can't remember. It, it might, I mean, we were talking about Brooklyn before. Mm -hmm. um, they were one of the earlier successful ones to come over here, weren't they? Um, yeah. So it would have been trying something like that. Uh, I'm struggling to remember. I can't think why. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it all blurs into one in your, like your early 20s i suppose yeah. um what do you think of this this is lovely uh let me have a little bit more hang on. yeah so much flavor um and yeah 
this is sort of towards the top end of my uh, sort of ABV range, I would say. So I wouldn't need more than one or two of these at a time, but <laughs> really, really, really yummy. Um, yes, nice work. But this was the the sort of beer style that really uh, turned saw us turn a corner. So back when we were experimenting with lots of different styles, some of them new, some of them old, we were really curious about the ingredients that, uh, at least back in 2015, were often being um, a little bit forgotten about or a little bit under explored. We felt so yeast at that point in time in hoppy beers. It was, a, it was a very, very popular yeast strain called USO5 that was pretty much the backbone for most craft beer in the UK for years. And when we stumbled ac across um, Hop from Vice and decided that we were going to try it, it really blew our minds to know that we could put very, very aromatic yeasts together with really bold modern hopping rates and also New World Hop varietals and produce something that was just like incredible and rich and luscious. And the great thing about wheat beer yeast, apart from all of its flavor, is it actually does a really good job of building up body. Um, so it's not it's not altogether common for folk um, to talk about what yeast does to the body of the beer, but wheat beer yeast, um, and certainly the strain that we like to use, does a really, really good job at like holding a lot of texture together. So something that we always love is, you know, when we build up something that's this fruity, I think it's got to have something of the texture of that fruit in the glass. It shouldn't be obviously thick and pulpy, but it should have something that's kind of luscious and almost yeah. approaching, I guess, like kind of like mouth coating quality of a tropical fruit. Um, is that something that you get from this sort of beer, Victoria? Like, do you kind of yeah, appreciate it? Kind of, I'm not saying it's as far as banana smoothie, but you definitely nah, get yeah. that kind of like, <laughs> you're right, the coating of the mouth. It's like, oh, I used to drink this really rubbish tropical juice that you could get from Morrison's when I was like nine. Well, I don't know why my parents gave it to me, but it's the same sort of nice soft feel, I guess. Um, Tom, you you guys have must have had a bit of a strange year. Sorry, we've, we've been talking about sort of all the, the beers that we've been making this year and actually how for us with pubs being closed it's been really tricky to get our beers out to people in that way but for you guys not being able to play gigs not being able to go and record in studios together that this must have been a really bizarre time to be a musician right yeah absolutely uh quite challenging um especially i mean on the live front challenging doesn't really cover it just <laughs> impossible yeah. um but um we had last year sort of earmarked to record and had done for quite a few months prior to that. Uh, and initially sort of this time last year when we were just making the arrangements to actually travel to Atlanta, uh, where we were gonna record with our producer, Ben Allen. Um, that's where he's based. Um, that's when we realized we couldn't go and flying there was out of the question and the initial message was well let's just delay it and mm. wait we can do that and I, but i'm so glad we just almost immediately said no we just got to have a plan b um and ben agreed to do do it remotely and we just had to work out how to do that that's amazing board. like this is the remote pub right now so you had a remote <laughs> recording studio yeah we did i mean the three of us the three main members of the band, we, we kind of work, set, we're used to working separately at the writing stage anyway, so it wasn't a huge leap of imagination, especially for Dunk, our uh, guitar player, and Paul, our singer. They often swap demos via email and just add their, their parts to each other's demos. Um, so that stage didn't change drastically. Actually, to be honest, the, the main difference was recording uh, the drums you can't yeah. I, yeah. I don't have the drum kit at home I have to be in a studio and it has to have at least 10 microphones for it to sound half decent yes so I was the only one who actually went to a normal studio uh, and I was in Liverpool um, and used a local studio there which had two big rooms and I was in one the engineer was in another uh, and this by this time it was sort of May so it was boiling hot because um, of the heat wave which made it even weirder. Um, and we just did it remotely 
Ben was on a, a computer screen on a drum stool next to next to me on uh, FaceTime, and we, they worked out a way of s- streaming the desk in the studio I was at mm. out of the st- his desk in Atlanta. So he was hearing in real time okay. what I was doing, and he could manipulate the sound with his equipment and get what he wanted, as well as direct me um, on the on the call. So. That's, was, I mean, that's a, quite an extended talkback loop, but I'm really yeah. glad that you made that work. <laughs> yeah. you, guys had, you guys had quite a lot of foresight making that call because in May, I think people were still hoping like by the mm. end of the summer, things were going to come back to normal. So there must have been tons of battles yeah. delayed. I, yeah, it's partly because we're stubborn gits and <laughs> partly, partly because we, 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 we'd we already waited quite a long time to get around to arranging it by this time last year. So we, we, we'd already kind of run out of patience. Uh, we were just desperate to get on with our, our job. You know, we, we, I mean, obviously we didn't know at that point we weren't gonna be able to tour for ages as well, but we knew we didn't want to go back on the road then. And mm. we'd done, I don't know, two and a half years touring on and off since the last record. So we, did, we really didn't need to do any more um, at that point. And, recording was was the priority so we we were going to do it by hook or by crook when you guys in in normal life when you guys have done a session like that but all together do you unwind with a beer like if you go somewhere like atlanta and you're there for like what three weeks a month that that must be quite an intense time you must need to i don't know is a beer a good idea when you've done a a long day in the studio or not (laughs) um i i think so depends what you've got to do the next day (laughs) <laughs> uh, we actually did our last album recording in Chicago um, and the first night we got there, the day before we were scheduled to start recording, um, we met up with some friends and went out to this um, Fall and Smith's mm. trip, you yep. know, randomly, uh, which was brilliant. Actually, the, the, it alternated between the Fall and the Smith's and that night it was a fall night. And they're one of my favorite bands of all time. And we were jet lagged and it it was an American bar with lots of American beer, local Chicago beer. Um, and yeah, somehow we still managed to record the next day. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, it, 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 it is, it is part of it. I think, I think when you're, you know, go, you've gone somewhere that far away and you know, you, you, you're spending quite a large budget on, on a project like that, it makes you, excited and nervous and beer helps to a certain extent <laughs> uh, take the edge off that for sure yeah i think that it must be such a, a fascinating uh line to walk as well between wanting to breed those final human experiences in before you pour yourselves onto tape um yeah. to, to then go out go back out and touch the lives of hundreds of thousands of people that listen uh, you know arguably millions of course that listen thereafter um, that must be quite a sort of tricky balancing act. And, and so how did, you know, how did the post recording sessions feel back in May last year? I mean, it was obviously great that you managed to virtually hook everybody up, but you know, did, did you, did you feel like it was a bit flat and, and what were you doing to try and like keep the energy up on the record? Well, that is a good question. It was, ve- it was very different, obviously very different from hanging out in a bar in Chicago after uh, a recording set you know being separate it did take the the social um and uh, the emotional edge off the recording you know not being able to share mm. um those moments you know which were really gratifying when you when you do something together and you can you can all hear you've done something good and you can kind of celebrate it um it really it, it it did suck a little bit of the fun out of it in that sort of celebration your, your, your ability to celebrate it that way, um, unfortunately, but at the end of the day, that's not the point, you know, that's not what people hear. Um, sure. And uh, yeah, it, it, it just made it, it kind of focused us as well. You know, you have to be um, better at communicating, you know, there's so much uh, in, in a creative environment that just relies on body language and you know you can you can convey ideas to each other when you're next to one another in such a more natural and instant way obviously so 
doing it by you know zoom and whatsapp and email which is what we did um just took a lot more patience and and you had to be a bit more conscientious about what you were saying because someone could misinterpret it and because you you're all taking away what each other have said and dealing with it independently rather than as a group at all times so yeah um I mean, I, I'm really pleased with the results, and I don't think it. Um, I don't think it it, it it brought the quality down in any way. It just changed the experience um, quite, so no, quite profoundly. I was going to say. So normally, after you've recorded a record like that, you'd kind of be gearing up to to showing it to people, to to mm. touring and stuff. And then obviously that that's all gone mm. away. Um, for for touring as well, when when you guys are out and you're all together, do you like to wind down after a gig? And celebrate have some beers or are you or has that changed a bit as you guys because you know seven albums now right yeah versus versus like 2004 tom how much does a 2021 tom enjoy having a big session after a gig um depends on the gig i mean all gigs are still very exciting and you, you still we still get nervous mm. and there's still a lot of energy to kind of wind down afterwards doesn't matter what it is whether it's a festival thing or or a small gig in a place where we only can sell 17 tickets you know um it's still a big buzz being on stage any stage um so yeah for me personally a beer is has and has always been the way that i chill out after a show and it takes a few hours and and normally a few beers um not every time. I mean, sometimes you just you don't feel like it. You're you're quite tired, and you just need one. And you you you're in your bunk or in your hotel room, and you can get to sleep. But normally, um, we're just on a high, and we want to chat and listen to music and and have a little bit of a celebration. Assuming the gig's gone well, which happily I can say they they usually do. So you and know, you play playing sorry, sorry, playing the drums is such a, such a physical. Uh, such a physical onslaught uh to, you need to, to hydrate yeah, okay. <laughs> definitely you know and I, I think that there's so much physicality and obviously emotion uh behind all live playing but certainly certainly to you know to operate uh for uh, you know more than an hour um, with all four limbs um the discipline the physical discipline that that takes is it must really it must take its toll on your body where you, you must feel like you've done an intense workout after a gig. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, it is absolutely a workout. Um, and I mean, some, some venues are intolerably hot as well, or the light, the lighting rigs quite old and they, I don't know, the old lamps they use are just 20 times hotter. Oh. And, uh, and sometimes they're really low down as well. It really, the height of the stage is, uh, has a massive bearing on how much, you know, how much um, sweat comes out of you in the process of a show. And, um, and for me, yeah, I mean, I'm, it hasn't really been a good gig if I haven't, you know, lost a lot, a, a lot of liquid over the, over the course of it. And, um, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm, you also get used to it, you know, whatever, whatever, say you do any kind of exercise or sport regularly, your body, I mean, I've been doing it, since I was a teenager quite regularly. And, um, and I'm, I, I guess my body has got more and more used to it. And, uh, but it's funny, we don't release music quite as regularly as we used to do. And therefore we don't tour as intensively as we used to do. So that we quite often end up playing a show kind of out of the blue mm -hmm. these days, like, especially these last few years we've done, I don't know, half a dozen shows over two and a half years. Mm. And a lot of them have been with a layoff of, of weeks and months yep. between. And if, if you're playing an hour set um, in front of a festival crowd, you know, where the, the, the adrenaline's really going, it, it, yeah, it's, it's totally exhausting. You can't really explain it to people I you know I, I usually need a couple of days to recover from something like that <laughs> especially if the muscle memory is gone if you've had that long break like yeah that's it you you, mm. you it, I, I think the real 
expenditure is in, is in your mind. You know, it's, mm. it's the nervous energy that really zaps you. Uh, I think the body, even after years, uh, or even after months not playing, you kind of, it's like riding a bike kind of thing, but you, it's, the, it's the mental energy it takes out of you. Is there it's anything the that you do in that kind of downtime then, you know, when you've got such long period between performances, like um, I was going to ask you before you said that, I was going to ask you what you do to keep yourself sharp physically. Uh, because obviously that very sort of demanding output, like you just have, to, you simply have to perform. Um, and there's no ifs or buts about it. Your body has to do what it needs to do. But now hearing you say that actually you certainly feel that mental drain, is there something that, that you've done in your career or is this something that you've done specifically in this past year to help you kind of accommodate these, the, the lulls, if you like, in between those intense moments? Because um, I'm fascinated by, I'm fascinated by how you carry that, you know, and how you accommodate that like massive zap on your energy. Um, or indeed, the other way to look around, look, look at it actually is probably, you know, how you build all that energy up uh, that you've got at your disposal for that gig. Yeah, it's, I think, I think the longer you have to think about a gig, the longer you anticipate a show and visualize it, uh, the more chance you're going to be nervous by the time you get there. But it also helps. I, it, it, you can you can really feed off it as well. Um, like we we actually did our first full performance a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, it, we did like a filmed thing for the first time, and um, and yeah, the build up to it was was intense because there was nothing else to to think about for a while and. Um, and it, I think it, it just, it, it really just focuses you in the end. You, you mm. I, th I don't know, maybe I am a bit better at that now. I think when, <laughs> when we were in our twenties, um, everything just came at us one thing after another. We didn't have time to think. And sometimes you, it exposed us and we weren't ready to play like our first big show at Reading or something. It didn't certainly <laughs> didn't feel like it were. Um, Whereas now I think I think yeah we've been around the block a bit and we and we're used to having these long layoffs and we can just yeah somehow summon some kind of zen on the day. Because <laughs> uh, the yeah. three of you you've been together so long. How has your relationship as a band changed? Has it evolved for the better? Have you all matured at the same rate? Like some of you have got kids now. You know, how has it been going from like early twenties that full on sudden burst to like you know Mercury. Uh, nomination 2004 like that really really busy time compared to now Oof. um that's a big yeah, deep it, question it, sorry maybe we should <laughs> wait until we've had the second beer before no, we that. no comment on uh the the sort of relative rates of maturity um, <laughs> yeah. I, I can only speak for myself of course um i mean we have all we have all grown up you can't not grow up in 17 years or whatever it is mm. um and yeah we've 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 all got family now uh, and it is a, it's just a totally different life we lead these days but the music is still this sort of dream that hasn't changed you know the dream we had even from before we got signed mm. we're still chasing it obviously we got signed it's but that wasn't that wasn't the end that that was a big step up but we're still chasing this dream of being whatever you imagine it to be when you're a teenager it's still kind of there you're, you're in, in this kind of suspended adolescence really uh, i love it it sounds like you guys are still like super passionate about you know i'm not that i'm saying that you necessarily would sort of grow tired of it but you it sounds like you still really really love what you do it's just yeah. changed a bit um as you've got older yeah you, you just have to sort of pursue it in a different way now it's um yeah a strange balance between domestic life uh, and, and and rock and roll or whatever but yeah when you're 20 and you you know don't have that in your in your personal life it, it, it is it was more all-consuming um speaking of the domestic I have yeah. I have a suggested question here from one of my colleagues which is what's in your fridge right now and I don't think he means your broccoli I think he means what beers do you keep in at home um well, it's just over there, but I, uh, I won't go and look. I think I know uh, we have a little bit of wine and a white wine. 
Uh, beer wise, we've got um, some shipyard, I think. Oh yeah. Uh, um, there's a local brewery here called Time Bank. Yep. And and the Morrison's near me sells their their stuff. And there's one called Monument. Uh, how how appropriate for uh, there's a <laughs> song called Monument. Like I like to have you know beer beer with the same title as Maximo Park songs. Nice. Uh, well, <laughs> you guys have actually yeah. like created beers as well though for the release of was it your fifth album you created a beer you've had like a right. brown ale with your name on it yeah yeah <laughs> yeah we have had a few dalliances with beer um so that was um more due um, yeah oh classic brewery I, I i fear that they've um i fear that they've taken uh quite a hit uh, over these past few years i know that they'd announced that they were tying up their operations of course it could have been a couple of years ago now uh, oh. but they were a, they were a, a phenomenal uh, innovative pioneering brewery in the northeast uh, always on the bar at free trade in every time I come back up to yes. visit there um, and it's uh, it's it's been actually one of the the sort of saddest parts um, of our professional lives in the industry recognizing those wonderful breweries that typically started about 20 years ago uh, not all of whom managed to transition fully, uh, reinvent themselves for the sort of modern consumer uh, that was yeah. looking for something bolder or more interesting or more intense. Um, and uh, yeah, it, like I say, I fear that I fear that the majority of Mordew's operations uh, oh, fallen yeah. by the wayside. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, I was. I haven't. Well, obviously, I haven't been to the pub much. Uh, yeah. I only actually re recently moved back to the northeast, so I haven't been out to see. Hmm. Who you know who's selling what now? And I, yeah. I, I didn't realize that they were struggling, but um, that's a shame because uh, I've always loved their beer and the, the beer they made uh, for us, which was just called Maximo Number no. Five mm. um, for our fifth album launch, was, was delicious. Uh, and it, it was so delicious it sold out really quickly, and we were hoping to keep some back for when we got home, uh, but it uh, it all got drank. No <laughs> so, but they, yeah, Mordu had a. Um, they had great beer names, so their one of their regular was called Raji Gaji. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, uh, and uh, <laughs> Worky Ticket. I think that was my favorite. delicious beer. Really, um, really, uh, th you know, if you want to, if you want to pull some like wonderfully playful and approachable names that aren't going to offend anybody, um, uh, you know, and that but that definitely have that sense of place in Geordie culture. Uh, yeah. That was amazing. I was going to ask, actually, just on, um, ob obviously, we, we spoke before about last year, obviously, presenting all sorts of different challenges, especially to, uh, you know, musicians that usually would have cut a decent part of their check from touring. How, how, how is it for you guys being uh, as well established as you feel you are at this point in time? And what do you have any advice for younger or less well-established artists out there that are kind of looking at the enormity of 2020 and that horrible pause in their career that disconnect with audiences especially on a live basis you know what what's getting you guys through this that you think might work out to be good advice for folk that are looking at this present moment and even the immediate future thinking that i might as well pack it in I, well, I hope that I hope they're not thinking I might as well pack it in. I guess you have to be realistic about what money you can get from it. Yeah. Um, and if you're passionate about it, you'll just make it work. You'll you know you'll you'll make sure you've got the time to do whatever whatever it is you can do, whether that's film yourselves or or hopefully it's not too long before some kind of outdoor yeah uh, events can happen. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I think with music, you know, it is it, it is a it's a, always a labour of love for anyone who does it properly, and you just find a way, and mm -hmm. you, can't, you don't know how to, kind of thing. Um, so I would just say, yeah, you've got to be innovative. It helps if you know someone who knows what they're doing with, like video cameras and video editing and stuff like that. Like we we do rely on people filming us and and being quite savvy with internet stuff. I mean, I, if it was left to me, it would be a disaster. <laughs> we wouldn't be having this conversation now. But um, yeah, it helps to have someone with a bit of tech savvy 
I mean, it do, I mean, you, you usually find one person in a band who who is tech savvy because you have to be to record stuff and things like that. So, yeah. and like I say, in our band, it's not me; it's Dunk. He's <laughs> more more into that sort of thing. Well, I I don't feel like rushing you, um, but I, I also feel uh, like sampling this next beer. I have finished this one. You've oh, oh wow, Victoria! I'm, I'm sorry. Smell. This is this is one of my absolute favourites, and it's really funny because I don't specifically like vice beer, but I really like this. The, the next one that we we bought, uh, and I think you you might have one as well as a dipper. So this is yes, much this stronger. is this is, this is so way I'm, out of your comfort zone. I'm sorry. only drinking a, about a third of it. The funny thing is, Tom, you were saying that you're like. The 6.5 is about the edge of your comfort zone, and it is for me yeah. as well. And I the thought thing with... that 8 was a 5 initially. but Oh, it... no, sorry. Yeah, uh, looking a bit closer now, right. Okay. <laughs> I have to say, uh, cloud water dippers are deceptive. Like You you, you think you're drinking a 4 or a 5, and it's, it's yeah. not. Because they taste, they taste tasty, so watch yourself. But okay. um, <laughs> we, were, we were talking about um, sort of what was in your fridge right now, and like beer being a really good thing to wind down with after a after a gig for the band, but also for, for the crowds, like mm. how, how much of a, a relationship do you think, I'm not saying you, you know, you can't go to a gig sober, of course you can, but for a crowd enjoying music, beer often goes hand in hand. Um, but a lot of venues tend to have pretty bog standard stuff on draft. Do, yeah. do you find that in places that you play? Like, um. And well, I mean, it's it's different for us because obviously we can we can have whatever we like backstage. And what, yeah. Oh yeah. What, What's your rider? <laughs> <laughs> well, our rider isn't crazy. It's it's lo the local beer. We like to try whatever we can wherever we can. It, it quite often gets ignored, and we just get a, you know crate of Bex or something like that, which is is not the end of the world, obviously. But um, yeah, we we ask to try some local brew. That's really cool. Um, because we can and it makes it different you know you don't want to drink the same thing every night um but in venues i know what you mean i think i think certainly the bigger venues not that we play them arenas and all the academies you know they're, they're more like chains aren't they and they, yeah. they they have big contracts with you know huge beer brewers i'm sure and yeah it feels like you're at a sports event and it's it's a sort of secondary consideration how tasty the beer is I, I, it's a shame I th that's got to change yeah know, sure. I really I really feel you like the number of gigs that I've been to at Royal Northern College of Music here in Manchester or um, band on the wall um, and just been at the bar and ended up uh, you know chatting away with someone that's either with the crew or even one of the performers or musicians themselves and they say, oh, you know, what, what should I have? And I'm like, oh, I wish I None could of point, this. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could point you to something that was really going to stand up. You know, I feel so sorry for folk that bring some of the best exper cultural experiences you can have to the city. And then the city doesn't facilitate showing its wares off to the best of its ability um, in return. And especially yeah. when, you know, uh, we, we've, we've hosted... Uh, a few bands uh, here in the tap room after hours because similarly got talking at a gig and folk are like great we really want to go out for that after show beer and i'm like um it's manchester everywhere's going to shut at like 11 on a wednesday night um so that's another thing that tends to be a little frustrating too so i, I really think that they're certainly from a sort of brewery perspective we, we would love to be um changing both the experiences that visiting musicians have for the one night in our city, um, yeah. but also yeah. bringing, you know, also bringing that strong local vibe through to folk that are out enjoying the gigs. It seems like such a missed opportunity. Yeah, well, I don't know. I'm, I mean, because I used to live in Liverpool and I went across to Manchester for a lot of gigs. I think I probably saw more gigs in Manchester than Liverpool um, over that time. And I like the Deaf Institute's got okay beer. Oh, incredible, um, yeah, actually. Um, Gorilla um, as well. Pardon? Gorilla. They had a really good yeah. yeah. And um what I was gonna say, the um the Albert Hall yep. is, a, is a great venue and and for the size they are, that they, they they definitely serve better than average beer. Um uh, so yeah, let's hope more and more venues can do that. I think the Academy, what or what was an academy here in Newcastle has been recently taken over and will hopefully have a more you know, a more forward thinking attitude about what's behind the bar uh, i think i think that will happen and maybe yeah maybe if 
uh, venues are operated by local, more local minded people. Um, that will ha happen naturally. Let's see. I mean, it's going to be such a different landscape. Oh, you know, once yeah, totally. everything's back up and running, I think things will change and maybe that, this is one of them. I, I, it's difficult to imagine, obviously, even from even from this very, very optimistic point in time that we're at right now, seeing the vaccine roll out um, and seeing case numbers drop, you know, it kind of it feels like surely 2021 should be a bit of a tipping point for us here in the UK. And, you know, may, maybe it's reasonable that we that we can genuinely start to hope for some sense of new normal to appear um, in front of us at the back end of the year. Yeah. What is it that you're most looking forward to? What, what the first thing when 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 you genuinely feel safe to get out uh, and and get you know in in the thick of it amongst a whole load of strangers at a venue? What's the thing that you're going to look forward to the most? Is it going to be a gig? Um, is it going to be going out to eat? What is it that you're missing the most right now? I, I think it is a gig. Yeah. It's being like when, um, when I'm shuffling my iPod and a song comes on that starts with crowd noise because it's off a live album. Yeah. That, get, that gets harder and harder in a way at the moment and you, you, you realise how much you're missing it. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, just being in a big crowd. In it's a, that collective in a proper experience. atmosphere. Yeah. It's, you know, it's it's the best feeling. And yeah, I'm, I'm, re I'm really hoping to be back there soon on, on either side of the, the barrier. Um, I, like, I like playing a gig recently in front of a film crew where there's no applause or any sound at all in between songs was just so weird and you know great that we could do it and that we were asked to do it and we could deliver it but so different to mm. a, a, a real atmosphere you know that people are out there watching it um yeah. but it it, it it pales in comparison to the real thing of course they're also holding on to all this energy that they can't release at the end of each yeah. song as well. Because you're not sat in your living room with your headphones on being like, <gasps> oh, I can't clap because the neighbors <laughs> think I'm really weird. <laughs> it's just the weekend. <laughs> um, yeah. Tom, tell me a bit about the, the album. It's coming out uh, later this month and it's called Nature Always Wins. I, like to me, that is the ultimate 2020 name because it feels <laughs> like throughout all of last year, the only thing that was carrying on as if nothing had happened was nature, you know, the, the yeah. flowers, flowers still burst through the, the birds were still tweeting and singing. Is is that what the inspiration has come from? Or is it, was no, that it, always it, the idea of the album name? It, 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 it genuinely it's very was, prescient. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's just one of those things. Um, it, it was, it was a happy accident in terms of being relevant um, because the lyrics, all, all our album titles are, taken from lyrics and uh, the song Child of the Flatlands, well, all the songs um, and that one that the, that line was taken from, they, the, the words were written before the pandemic um, and whether we decided that should be the album title um, later, I can't, I can't be sure. Um, but it, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of spooky actually the way, the way it, came out um, in that way um, and how ap appropriate it's ended up sounding, but it's not it's not deliberate. I mean, I think at one point, uh, someone from the label was suggesting that we uh, had some face masks made with the album title on. Um, and, you know, we thought, well, yeah, that, you know, that's a good bit of merch. But then when we thought pe if people are walking around saying nature always wins, uh, oh yeah, it makes COVID sound like the ultimate winner, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah it's, maybe, maybe not. Um, and what's yeah, what's the kind of the the sound and style of the album? How does it differ to your previous releases? Is it sort of a how long has it been since the last, the, since the sixth, the seventh? Have you had a yeah, it, well, it, your style to change? Yeah, it has. Um, I mean, it's it's been the longest gap between records, and uh, and a lot has changed in that time. Make, mostly. Um, Lucas, our keyboard player, uh, left the group to emigrate to Australia at the beginning of 2019. And we kind of started writing the album after that. So it's the first thing we've ever done without him, mm -hmm. um, which left a big space. Um, 
it, and and the, there was you know positives and negatives to that. Uh, obviously, we miss him, um, miss his uh, creativity and his musicality. But um, in terms of the arrangements of the songs, not um, almost by default having a keyboard part in every song um, has changed how we sound. I think. Um, I mean, most of the songs have ended up. Uh, with keyboards on in the end anyway, because Duncan, our guitar player, also writes and records using various synths and things like that. Um, and ben Allen, the producer, also added a lot um, from his studio. Um, but yeah, and, and Ben as well, I think, has had a big influence, huge influence on, on, on us and the sound of the record. We. I think I think because we were suddenly down to three original members, we felt more than ever we needed to work with a, a producer this time. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we have worked with someone uh, or co collaborated with someone on 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 every record, but we haven't worked with a sort of fully blown producer. I think mm -hmm. since um, the National Health when we were recorded with Gil Norton, um, which was nearly ten years ago. So and so, you were looking for that producer role to be really another creative force in the yeah. not, not not sort of front end in the songwriting process and the demoing process, but more you know applying all that finesse and looking at the parts that need to be there to really get all that emotionality across. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, um, Ben. I mean, we've known about Ben for a long time and admired what he's done. Uh, particularly with the American group Deer Hunter. Oh yeah, um, phenomenal. And Animal Collective, I think, was where we first heard about him. Um, and but we we he he turned out to be a perfect fit for mm. us. Now um, he he can play bass and keyboards, so he can automatically sort of finish off arrangements um, on on some of the stuff, but. Uh, and also some of the compositions that he co-wrote a couple of the songs as well, which is a completely new thing for us. We've never outsourced any um, any part of the writing process. I mean, that just happened kind of naturally. He just that's just the way he works. He picks up a guitar uh, and hears things. So um, that was great. It, it kind of yeah expanded our horizons a lot working with him, and um, and he he really did a great job hearing um, hearing a direction for the for the whole because I think when we first approached him we gave him about 15 tracks and he said I'm not going to pass judgment on any of this I just want you to send more and in the and he said can you maybe do 30 and, or, I think it was 30 or maybe 25 I can't remember it might be exaggerating but um we thought oh we don't normally write that that's two albums not one um <laughs> And that, but it, were, it it just forced us to be creative, and and and, um, and then we whittled it down to twelve, I think. Um, and just yeah, he's just got a really good ear, and he managed to make it come together in in, in a really meaningful way. He kind of got what we were trying to do um, musically and lyrically. He's a couple of years older than us, but he's got similar age kids, and he's just in a very similar place to us personally, I think. And his music taste crossed over a lot with ours. So, yeah, I, 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 it was a great experience. And uh, it was a, obviously a big shame we couldn't go to Atlanta and use his studio. But maybe we'll do that another time. We'll see. For sure. How do you feel then about those um, 18 songs that didn't make the grade? Or maybe it wasn't 18, <laughs> but 13. <laughs> Poor do, rejected do you, children. <laughs> do, you, do, you feel, do you feel kind of relieved to have had somebody help you really sort of pick out the ones yeah. that are going to push the buttons for your fans the most? Big time. It's, it, it, mm. it's so hard making decisions, especially with just three of us now. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, obviously two to one, we can always come up with a majority on most. <laughs> it really has to be unanimous. What's up, what's up in each other in the side <laughs> being like it? <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't gang up on each other that way. I mean, um, it, yeah, it, it really helps having a, a director. You know, that's what he was. He was our, our director and sort of he took authority a little bit. You know, we, we don't have a natural leader in the group who kind of 
you know make has the last call on 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 most things so we and and as a result we struggle we struggle to make effective decisions regularly so to have someone do it for us was brilliant <laughs> Very, uh, big just hand over the responsibility <laughs> <laughs> exactly oh, that sounds good um yeah it's fascinating i think that one of the one of the challenging aspects of growing this brewery and evolving it slowly over time and just really being changed by our output and by the feedback that we get from our fans and our drinkers is you know like holding something firm about our identity over time but also being changed by the world around us so you know we we face regular um uh crises almost uh, when we talk at a very high level about who we are and what we're trying to do because our, our work has so much creativity in it here across uh, from you know all the way from the recipe design to imagining how the beers look and what they're called and how we present them to the world um, and thankfully most of that is just a sort of fleeting one-off experience but we're always you know we're only we're babies really we're only a six-year-old company but we're constantly asking ourselves what, what is it that we're actually here to do you know what is what is our purpose uh in in running this business and having this output um i'm curious to hear because i think everyone's got a different angle on it you know what is it that keeps you fresh and vibrant but also you know where do you find that kind of seat or that home of of consistency across a a, a career where you've you know, you've 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 gone a little bit left and a little bit right, and kind of explored uh, not the outer edges, but certainly explored uh, a, a wide variety of your tastes and influences through your musical life. What is it that kind of keeps you feeling like you're being true to your creative self, uh, whilst also being true to what you know your fans want from you? Because I guess you'll hear the full gamut of like oh my god never make a record like that again to like please just make every record sound like that <laughs> yeah it's funny and i hope no one takes this the wrong way but we, we really don't think about what our fans want at all um when it comes to the music um we do with merch like i said <laughs> uh, but it, you you can't we it's not that we don't want to we just don't need to we just I think honesty uh, with ourselves and therefore with 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 everyone else is is the key. Um, we we are quite painfully honest with each other, and it and it hurts a lot of the time because you know you we are real music boffins. We love hot music from all eras, and we're mm. always listening to new stuff. Um, and we're just kind of restless like that and never totally satisfied. So, um, it, it, I don't know, it, it's quite a sweeping subject, but like, um, it's about, um, yeah, being honest and having and allowing each other to criticize uh, what, what everyone's doing. You have to if someone is too guarded um, about what they're doing or about what someone else is doing, too unwilling to pick it apart, um, then you, you, you're you not going to get the best out of each other. Um, sure, definitely. And I, I, think, I think it's that really. We, we're just, we, we've ended up being quite realist, realistic um, about what, we, what we're capable of. Um, Techno yeah. and it's good to have it's good to have parameters you know we're not we we are still quite punk in that we can't play everything you know there's, <laughs> there's like there's you know that we our talent only goes so far in terms of what we can play um and and that and that kind of dictates the sound and that automatic automatically makes it sound like us as well yeah. so in terms of like your question about considering what fans expectations i think people who followed us know that you know we have a sound you know i have a certain way of playing drums and paul certainly has a very recognizable voice and you, you not those sort of fundamentals never change because they can't unless you sort of replace replace us um yeah so definitely. 
Um, I mean, it's funny, we're now a three piece having started out as a five piece. So we've lost two of our kind of original core members and sounds as well. But I think there's still enough personality in the three of us who remain to for it to be, you know, unrecognized, uh, unrecognized, Rec <laughs> unmistakable. <laughs> unmistakable. <laughs> cheers. Cheers. unmistakably us. I, I meant I meant to ask, what do you think of the dip of things we're cheersing? Um, it's a stealth beer, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, messing with my vocabulary already. Uh, it's <laughs> yeah, I have to confess that um, when, you know when when we make a, a very very drinkable beer, it's exactly what we intend to do. Um, but it's it sometimes feels almost irresponsible uh, given that we make a lot of strong beer. Um, that when we make something that drinks below its strength, um, that's a sign of good brewing. Um, yeah. And I think this is it. But also, it's <laughs> it, it, you, you, it you're stealth. almost you're almost guilty when you put it out because you think, oh gosh, someone's gonna someone's not gonna read that eight percent ABV on the front. And well, Tom read it as five. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that we got, I'm glad that we caught that for you. Paul, Paul's yeah. advice is always put it in the fridge. It'll keep some fizz. You can have some yeah, tomorrow. Definitely, like no need, no need to rush through yeah, either of these cans. Like they'll be great tomorrow. Uh, so back in the fridge and, no. and uh, yeah. cold temperatures keep all the C will keep more of the CO two um, in the liquid. So the colder it is, the more it'll retain, and it, and it'll they'll both still drink great tomorrow if you don't want to go through them. Um, I, a little bit in relation to your last answer, really about the sort of limits of your abilities. Uh, defining your sound is there a this is a little bit geeky is there a time signature um that you that you've always wanted to 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 have um a song written in uh, but you just couldn't make it work with that like you say with that kind of like punk edge you're like probably can't make that time signature work but you are, as a drummer would love to geek out Ooh, um i don't know i i know i know a percussionist up here, a um, guy called Brendan Murphy, who is unbelievably talented. And um, I went and played the kit in his percussion workshop one day, a long time ago. And um, well, we start, he started off showing me the various mad instruments that I'd never <laughs> not even heard before. Like he had all these different bells, types of bells from Asia and homemade stuff. Um, and, but he he had he has got a really good knowledge of like traditional rhythms from various parts of the world. And I think there was a Turkish beat or style that he I can't remember what he called it, but it was in nine was it in nine twelve or something? I can't even remember what it was. But he taught me it that day, and I kind of got to grips with it. And then I got on the kit, and he played I think vibraphone. That's his lead instrument to me on the kit. And I thought, wow, this I'm doing something really quite <laughs> you know, quite advanced here. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, uh, as soon as I left his his workshop, I had the, uh, the ability to do that uh, <laughs> recently. So um, I should probably go back. And now I'll move back to Newcastle. I might go and see him and he can teach me. Um, I th I th it's funny, like there's... Um, uh, Beatles song um, "Happiness Is a Warm Gun." Uh, I think that's got a few different time signatures in it, and one of them's ten. I don't know, it's ten four or ten eight. But the, the that mother superior job the gun that bit is it. Yeah, yeah. And 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 it sounds great. And I think I think that was you know they'd obviously been to India a lot then and learned again like sort of a different culture of music. And um, I, I, yeah, I think that. If I was to sort of have a passion for a particular rhythm or time signature, it would have to be through an experience. I'd like, you know, to travel somewhere and get to know a local form of, of playing, uh, and learn it that way, learn it from the source. But um, I mean, I, I, having said that, I mean, I, I do like the odd yes tune and oh, yeah. other, other prog um stuff you know uh bill bruford is is a is a great drummer and um not a massive influence i would say but inspiration now um and yeah i i um i do like 
a, a crazy type signature. But sometimes it feels like it's, um, to quote 10cc, uh, art for art's sake, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> a bit, it's a bit pompous, but when you're in the mood, uh, why not? Um, but we, I mean, we've, we've dabbled with a few odd time signatures over, over the years and that, but they're, it's, it's rarely from the impulse, like, oh, oh, I like this number. Let's try it in a song. It's uh, Dunkel just writes something that is, he, I mean, Dunk never counts anything. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, that's, much, your, that's your job, surely. <laughs> yeah, I, it's okay. I'll, I'll count it later. Uh, and he, he won't know that he's just written something in 7-4. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, it, it's up to me to find that out and then, uh, and then play it. So incredible. Uh, yeah, no, it's, I think there's a there's a world there's a world of expression out there and kind of, you know, we, we try and deal uh, as much as we can, obviously, in, in, in being obsessive about the technicalities behind our beer. We but love the, beer for beer's sake. Yeah. <laughs> you know, at the same time, you, you can't brew by numbers. Um, you know, it's got to be it's got to be on that sensory um, ex evaluation, which is, is it is it making you feel the way that you want? Your drinkers to feel yeah. uh if it you know if it gets you excited just to smell the thing you're off to a good start and if the first few sips work out well then again you know the chances are someone will get to the end of the glass and have had a, a wonderful time with it uh so yeah lots lo always lots of technicalities to consider but definitely um, there's a limit <laughs> yeah 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 happy birthday by the way oh, oh thank you very much thank yeah, you. appreciate that um yeah, it does feel, um, it feels a little weird to have, have only been able to celebrate our birthday uh, by, um, we did a, a virtual drink along uh, on Sunday. And then, um, I mean, obviously we, we brewed a whole bunch of special beer that uh, customers up and down the country have been drinking this past week. Um, and then we shut down the entire company uh, on Monday and Tuesday and had a whole load of funny, crazy, silly Zoom meetings with each other right. lots of creative stuff so we set a lot of uh challenges to the crew um to really get their creative juices flowing because it's it's hard trying to entertain anybody or you know make a rich social experience happen in these times when you can't be right in front of another human being you know reading their their body language and picking up on all that vibe yeah yeah it is it is a very odd time, but uh, it's not forever, and we'll uh, no. we'll enjoy the kind of human experiment in the meantime. And I've really enjoyed this afternoon, Tom. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, definitely. Oh, hey, thank you. Thank, Likewise. Thanks so much for being with us, and and thanks for uh, you know thanks for resting yourself away from sobriety uh, <laughs> for an for an hour and a so also with us. Uh, we really appreciate it, and we obviously. You know, like every uh, every conscious human being, we're really hoping that uh, industries like yours get to function uh, in some meaningful way, uh, both for the quality of experience that that's offered to people that you know really need that, um, and also just to get everyone's incomes uh, back on track. Uh, it's going to take a long time to uh, for the for the you know really for an industry that was already facing a lot of difficulties uh, yeah. a lot of you know financial hardships in uh, running venues and being somehow part of that whole chain of getting music from musicians heads to audiences uh, but we really hope that this year sees y you guys able to somehow get back out into the world in some meaningful way and look forward to look forward to your new release um, and seeing how that lands with everybody and I'm sure you know everything that's been everything that's coming out of the minute i think is getting a little bit more attention than it usually does because the news cycle is brutal and when good art drops um you just throw yourself into it so i really hope that your fans have bowled over and i hope that you guys really feel that when they when they all come back to you with their feedback thank you yeah and um it's one of the one of the sort of pluses is that people will definitely have had time to have listened to the album a lot before they actually come and see us play it live. So yeah. hopefully it won't be one of those typical album tours where some of the new stuff just doesn't quite, you know, yeah. get get the crowd going uh, as much as the old stuff. And um, yeah, we, we live in hope. Um, 
And but yeah, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, likewise, we'll I'll see you on the other side. Uh, okay. And uh, thanks for having me. Pleasure, absolute pleasure. Take care now. Cheers, Tom. Cheers.